Hello, everyone. This is episode three of All My Friends Need Therapy. And I'm here with my old friend, Kyle Ray. Um, Kyle, can you just uh, introduce us um, to who you are, what you're doing right now? Um, so my name is Kyle Ray, obviously, like you said. Um, and I am uh, currently hanging out talking to you, trying to figure out what this is going to be about and uh, try not to be nervous. There's no need to be nervous. This is a conversation between friends and that's how I like to keep it. Um, as far as like, when we think about like what you're doing now, like where are you in your life right now? Um, Work-wise, th things of that nature. Um, so I, I work at a company uh, where we sell lighting, electrical and AV supplies. Um, you know, it's a pretty young company um, growing very quickly, which is great. And it's a really solid atmosphere, a lot of good people, a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work, but a lot of good work. Um, and I'm learning new stuff every day. So I really enjoy that um, as my dog walks over to me and uh, realizes I'm talking to somebody now and is getting a little jealous. Um, so I basically just go to work. I hang out with my dog when I get home and I try to make sure that he doesn't eat my coasters. Um, you know, but okay. yeah, doing that, living in, living in Long Beach, living that lovely, lovely beach life, which is cool. And uh, just getting by, having a good time. So I heard you say one thing, um, working with good people. How important is that right now in your life to be working in a space where you're working with people you feel you can trust, good people that you can rely on? That is probably the most important thing, to be honest. I've been in different situations where I've had people who you, you can't trust, you can't rely on them. And, and it's, it's definitely not the uh, most enjoyable aspect. You know, I actually enjoy waking up at 5.30 in the morning, going to work and spending, you know, 10 hours there. I actually enjoy that. Um, whereas previously I would wake up late. I was just, it's just miserable. So honestly, I think the most important thing is, is being with good people, like you said, that you can trust and, and, but honestly, even just hang out with, um, you know, it's, I go to work and I'm not, I don't have coworkers. I have coworkers that I can be friends with afterwards, you know, and, and things like that. So it's, uh, it's been a game changer, I think, in terms of my attitude towards work and, and, you know, going to work. Yeah. Cause I mean, yeah, like you said, like before that you weren't in that space and, you know, I know for a long time you were, you were at a place, um, because for those of you who don't know, I've known Kyle for a very long time. We both have been friends for a very long time. And you were in a place that you thought you might be for a long time, where that was the future. And I've been there. I think a lot of people that might be, you know, will listen to this have been in that position where you're at this place where you see the next two, three, four, five years. Maybe you see that's the place that you retire at. Um, and I know that that's something that didn't work out for you. Um, what would, can you just talk a little bit about what that was like, what that transition is like and, and what it was like right after that for you? Um, you know, so that I think others can get a sense of how did, how did Kyle do it? How did he get to the point where he's waking up at 5.30, wanting to go to work, wanting to be there, wanting to enjoy his his uh the place that he's spending the majority of his time at um yeah so uh previously owned a business um that did not end up working out because of a lot of different reasons a litany of reasons if you will covid did not help um and yeah like i said i was i didn't see myself not being there i saw myself right. being there and trying to build something and, and get it to grow and and i didn't see that changing ever um you know so it definitely was not easy towards the end of things you know you start to realize wait a second maybe this isn't going to work out maybe this isn't going to be where i'm at and then there's definitely a sense of panic of well what what do i do because you know that's all i've known i right. had been there for 11 years or so 10 11 years and um you know i had things kind of kind of mapped out in terms of where that was going to be and going to take me and what I was going to do with it. Um, and, you know, it obviously slowly kind of faded away and you get to that point and I had no idea what I was going to do. You know, my first 
my first thought was, was obviously panic. Um, all right, I got to figure this out. Um, but then slowly reality kind of sets in and it's like, wait a second, I can, I can figure out what I want to do now. Um, right. you know, so I, I just kind of sat back a little bit and thankfully I had some, uh, financial planning in place. So I, it wasn't like, all right, I need to go and, and take the next job I get offered or, or anything like that. Um, but I was able to take some time and kind of just sit there and think and figure it out. And then I, you know, I mapped out different ideas of, of career paths and, um, you know, different jobs that I was looking at and kind of went from there. One thing I find interesting that what you said there is, you know, you're there for a long period of time and it's kind of what you think you, you get in this, this headspace where it's all you've known. It's all you thought you were going to do. And then once you're out of it, there is that initial sense of panic. And I've definitely been there, you know, like, um, I, I remember working in school systems and I left that job after six years and I was like, Whoa, what am I going to be doing? And I most recently left a job that I thought I was going to be at for the foreseeable future. Um, and didn't work out. Things change and you, you move on. Um, but I think one of the most important things that I heard you say there is you, you take a breath, you then realize that you have this blank slate and you can then, instead of thinking about all the things that like you felt you were supposed to do, you have a whole world in front of you. Cause I think a lot of that happens. And, and I mean, you can, you can speak on this, like with our, you know, a lot of our friends perhaps, and a lot of our generation, we get, we kind of follow suit. Um, and I know you come from, a, you know, a, a very popular town in Long Island, New York. And how many people do you know went through those motions of going, I'm going to, we're going to the same high school. We're all going to go to the same college. We're all going to get the same job. And then after that happens, you, you wake up one day and you go, I am, I am not an individual. I have no idea what I actually want. I just followed suit. So yeah. I can imagine that was important and kind of enlightening when you woke up one day and said, I have the whole world in front of me. I can kind of yeah. figure out what I want to do. Yeah. So, I mean, in reality, I would basically say that was my identity. My identity was, mm -hmm. you know, my business at that point. Like I, you know, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, everything's all right because, you know, I'm working and, you know, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I'm working six days a week when I'm yeah. not at work. I'm thinking about work. Um, you know, it was all going back to that. And, um, you know, speaking, <laughs> speaking of blank slates, I kind of, had a whirlwind of a, of a bit of time where I, I literally, so I closed my business, uh, ended a relationship, uh, uh all within a, a couple months span. So, um, you know, I went from very secure, very, all right, I, this is what I do. This is where I'm at to what, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. Very, very quickly. Um, you know, and, and I got pretty lucky, um, that I have some, some very solid friends, um, you know, two of my friends were literally like, they were like, Hey, come by, um, you know, let's hang out. So I went over there, hung out for a bit. Cause I didn't even have, in reality, I didn't, I, didn't, I lived with the per <laughs> with my ex-girlfriend. So yeah. I, I ended a relationship. I ended a business and I was like, all right, well, whose couch am I sleeping on? And, uh, what am I doing with my life? Um, and two of my friends were like, Hey, we're working remotely. We're going to go to Puerto Rico for a couple of months. You want to come? I was like, well, I've got nowhere to go. So how much is it? So we got an Airbnb down there. Um, they are both uh, very impressive people. Um, they helped me set up my resume. I never had a resume. I didn't need a resume. But yeah. So I, I never had a resume. So I didn't even know what I was doing with that. And I was like, all right, I've seen resumes and most of them are pretty not great. So I didn't know how to do that. Um, but they would. I would wake up in the morning I would go for a run. I would hang out on the beach for a little bit. I would go back to the, uh, to the apartment. They were working. Uh, um, I took an AutoCAD class online while I was down there. Uh, um, and I would work on my resume and, you know, it was just a, 
almost like a, a you know, I don't know if I'd, life-changing experience is a, a bit broad, but um, changed my outlook on so many different things because I'm so, I was so used to, no, no, you wake up, you go to work, you spend all day at work, you come home, you think about work. Um, you know, you just have a little bit of time on the weekends to do this. And I was now just like, wait a second, I can live in a place that's just kind of calm and chill and you know, there's no rush of, any, of anything. Um, and I can, I can take my time and kind of figure out what I want to do and who I want to be or yeah. who I actually am. Um, so that was just, you know, I don't know if uh, many people have that opportunity, but um, it was, it changed my outlook on everything. Yeah. Yeah. I like what you said there. I don't know if many people have that opportunity because sometimes it is hard to take that reset because there's, you know, you know, fortunately enough for you. Um, and I know fortunately enough for me, when I've been in that position, we have support systems that allow us to, um, take that breath and take that moment to reset and recharge and take a look at the, the field that's out there and see what, what we're going to do next. Um, but obviously that's not always true, true for other people. I want to go back real quick because I know when you had mentioned your business, you had talked about, um, you had mentioned COVID. Um, obviously, COVID's a hot topic, and it did a number on our country, on the world. Um, but you know, I've seen a lot, especially you know my my family lives where where you live, <laughs> and you know a lot of small businesses came and went um, during that time. What was what was that like being a small business in the midst of a global pandemic? Um, and essentially having to close the doors because, I mean, I know there were other factors, but I'm sure in a business that is relying on a supply chain, relying on manufacturing, relying on shipping, um, and people coming into the store safely. Um, yeah. What did that do to your business? I was, I mean, for lack of a better word, I think strange is the only thing I can say. Yeah. You know, it started off and it was like, all right, this is happening. I'm, we're not sure what's happening. Um, I told everybody that worked for me, I was like, hey, they're saying two weeks. Take your two-week vacation. Yeah. We'll pay you your vacation and we'll figure it out in two weeks and we'll figure out what's going on then. So two weeks came and went and it was like, well, it's going to be like two more weeks. So it was, okay, hey guys, just stay home. Um, collect unemployment. Uh, if somebody offers you a job, please take it because I don't know what's going on. Um, and then probably about a month and a half in, it was like, this is all right. So this isn't going anywhere. Um, so I basically told everybody, Hey, I gotta, I gotta lay you guys off again, take mm -hmm. unemployment. If you get a job offer, by all means, take it. Don't wait for me because I have no idea what's going on, but I was the only one there. I would go in in the morning. I would hope people would come in or call and then I would go home. Um, you know, the there were um, things put in place where any job site uh, could only have one contractor on it at a time. Hmm. You know, so it wasn't one contractor per company. It was if there's a plumber on the job site, the electrician can't go there. The right. pilot guy can't go there. So, you know, anybody that was coming in was was just trying to figure out what they were doing and nobody had any idea. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty in terms of how long could I stay open because who's coming in and buying stuff? Um, there was an, a lot of uncertainty of, well, where are these warehouses going to ship stuff from if they don't have employees working right now? Yeah. Um, so it was, it was impossible to get product in. Uh, I mean, we're still seeing that, but that's a whole other story. Um, and it was, it was a, a very interesting time of, you know, being in a building that once had, people walking in and out all day to me doing as much as I could to make sure things were running properly and hoping right. somebody would walk through the door or call me, um, you know, where somebody would call from the front door and be like, Hey, I'm out here. And I would have go and bring them their stuff and be like, all right, here you go. Good luck. Um, but it was, it was, um, it was a very interesting time just trying to put a game plan together for, for anything because it was just, just such a wild card. 
Yeah, I think I think a lot of people, you know, in the beginning, we thought it was going to be this two week we're done because we've never seen it before. You know, we live we live in the United States, you know, and things like this don't happen. We, you know, yeah. especially in, in our lifetimes, we didn't we we never probably would have thought that we were going to see something like this um, because all we did was hear what our grandparents went through, our parents, you know, their grandparents. Um, and we're like, that can't happen. That can't yeah. happen to us. We're yeah. so evolved, you know, and then something like that happens. And then it takes someone, you know, it ends up putting someone like you, a business owner in such a hard position where you have to lay people off. And I can't imagine that being an easy thing. Those people have families, those people have mouths to feed. And all of a sudden, just like that, it's, by the way, see ya, I'm g- I have to run this by myself. And then that becomes a very, very, I'm sure, lonely place and a place of no support when you're the one doing it yourself and you're already kind of feeling the pressure um, and then add that on top. So I can't, I can't even imagine what you and others that were in your, um, your position that, that eventually had to kind of shut the doors um, and, and start over had to go through I can't I it's just it seems insane and there's still and and the the sad part is is that there's still businesses and people in that position that are still even as things have lessened and we've seen restrictions come and go come back um there are still places that are still struggling to fill their store fill their restaurant fill their staff um and it's, it's, it's very sad because a lot of those people, I think, worked very hard for a very long time to have something of their own, similar to your story. And um, to have to say goodbye to that or to have to totally break it down to, to its kind of, to this bare minimum is, is something that is very challenging and sad. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, I'm, I'm, I consider myself one of the lucky ones, I guess, because I have this new opportunity. Um, but you know, so many people just, I can't even imagine half of their stories. Um, right. You know, it's, it's very sad and it's, it's, I'm lucky that I have that support system that I have the the people in my life that I do. Yeah. How important is that support system to you? Because I know that in the transitions that I've made, whether it be when I left my first school job and I didn't leave and it wasn't, you know, that no one threw me a parade when I left. So it was, I needed that support system. And even now, um, it wasn't necessarily a mutual decision. So, um, I needed that. I need that support system. I need my wife and my, my daughter and my family. How important is a support system when you're in those positions and then going forward, building back up, how important is that? Uh, incredibly important. I think, I mean, uh, it's, it's, just having some people that you can kind of explain what's going on, whether it's sometimes you don't even really know what's going on. You just have somebody to sit there and, you know, just listen. Um, you know, I'm one of those people that I think when I want to talk to somebody, I just want them to listen. You know, right. I don't need somebody to be like, Hey, have you tried this? Have you tried this? Have you tried this? What if you did this? What if you did this? And I have people that understand that, um, you know, I've got some really great friends that are just like, if you need advice, let me know. If you want me to listen, let me know. Um, so sometimes it's just literally a, a venting session of, you know, just talking to some friends over a beer or a cup of coffee or just hanging out, sitting around a, like a, a fire or something and um, just kind of being like, yeah, no, this, this sucks or this is great or this is what I'm dealing with. And it's just, you know, I, I need to get better at it because I'm pretty terrible at it. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, having the people that you can trust to just, kind of listen and understand and and just be like yeah no I'm not judging anything you're saying or what you're going through or dealing with is is it's been tremendous for me you know and I I definitely consider myself a very lucky person for it yeah for sure um I definitely hear you on that like it's one of those things where I will always suggest to people like reach out reach out and connect with people because you know, it's so important to not feel alone in those situations, I think. And it's so important to know that, like, 
the person doesn't always need to give you the answer. They don't always need to fix it. They just yeah. need to be, you know, the person that's going through something needs to know that. So like people that might listen to this again, like reach out to other people, um, even if you don't know them, right? Like, if you're a business owner, reach out to another business owner that you maybe look up to, or you might see that's, that's, that might need you just as much as they need, you know, you know, yeah. you need them. Or, you know, I know times for me when I've been in positions, I've reached out to some of like my favorite people, like, you know, singers or whoever it might be. And Hey, I'm going through a rough patch with this you know, could you give me any words of encouragement? And sometimes that reaching out doesn't work, but when it does, it helps you to feel like you're not so alone. And I think that's such an important thing because this, this, the past few years have been isolating and they've been, you know, and like, I consider myself very, very privileged in this situation where I have a lot of things in place, but there are so many people that don't, um, and have been struggling beyond belief and have been mistreated, you know, all, all of this stuff. And, you know, I think it's important that we, you know, we definitely reach out, but also if we, if we know someone's struggling, reach out to them and let them know that you're, Hey, Kyle, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Um, I hope at some point I did that for you. Cause now that I'm thinking and saying that I'm like, wait, did I reach out to Kyle when he was going through this? Um, so hopefully I did that. Um, but um, one thing, um, one thing I heard you talk about is couch surfing, and I say that to kind of segue into the next thing that I kind of want to talk to you about. So, um, for people listening, um, we've slept the, on a lot of couches. Yeah, Kyle and I have slept on a lot of couches, some together, um, floors floors together some in the same bed together um shout out uh j tag and and b tag um and all those people but um so kyle and i met um while we were both active musicians um kyle was a bass player i was a singer and we met on a on a new york city street and then found ourselves in the same band which is like an odd odd thing where it was like in passing where it was like hey man what's up how's it going and then all of a sudden we found ourselves in the same band and then gearing up to kind of tour the the east coast so can you talk to me a little bit about you know your kind of how you got to that point your musical journey and then we can kind of get into some of like the 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 real deal of touring in a <laughs> touring in a you know semi-popular band um yeah i mean so uh, where do you want me to start like it's it's just an interesting journey right so what i remember of your of your musical past right was you were in a band be right before you kind of made the i don't know what the the spacing was in between it but yeah, was yeah. It, I want to say it was Brightline. Yep. Brightline. Okay. So you were in you were in a band and you were probably yep. like every other Long Island kid in the world. You were in 17 different ones that had all sweet names. Oh and yeah, very sweet names. So let's start like let we'll, we won't go all the way back, but I think like what was it like to be a local Long Island band? Um it was an interesting like so I mean you would play at VFW halls. You'd play at churches. Like there was one church in um, in East Meadow called Calvary Lutheran Church, and I think it. I'm trying to remember if it was every Friday or if it was like once a month. Um, but a band called Patent Pending would play there yep. all the time, um, and it was. I think it was like five bucks to get in, or you could bring in like two cans of food. Um, yeah, I remember those shows. Yep. And, you know, you go in and it's just all sorts of terrible and good and mediocre and bands playing. And right. um, I remember the coolest part about that spot, and I could be, no, I'm definitely making this up. I think they had, oh, I can't remember now. That's so long ago. That's like 
almost 20 years old, 20 years ago. I'm getting That's old. right. Make it up. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, but all these bands would play um, and they would, the coolest part about that was there were these touring bands that would come through. Yeah. So bands you'd never heard of, bands from California. I'm pretty sure I saw the matches play there when I was like 15. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like all these different bands coming from all different places just to play this church. Right. And it was just like, you know, these guys would show up and they'd have their their 15 passenger van, maybe a trailer. And it's just like, you know what, that's the, these guys are in New York playing a show that, you know, this is this is the dream. Like, this is the coolest thing ever. And then, you know, you get older and you go to different shows and you start going to the city to see shows. There's a spot on Long Island that we talked about called the Downtown um, that is now a wing, uh, wing place and bar. Um, but not a they, bad alternative. It's, yeah, it's not bad. Uh, <laughs> but they like, you know, you'd see all these these small to mid sized touring bands like Fall Out Boy played there, and you know, yeah. I think that's it. it held two hundred people. I don't know, um, you know, maybe a maybe a little bit more, but it was just this cool thing to see. The coolest part about the the downtown was that they would have their touring bands coming through, and they would always have at least one or two local openers. Yeah. So it was one of the coolest things looking up there, being like, "Whoa, wait, those guys." those guys are playing opening for this band. They're, they're opening for this band. Like it was just the coolest thing. And just kind of growing up being like, this is, that's something I would love to do one day is, is just play a show to, you know, 50 people play a show to a hundred people that are there to see me or my yeah. band or whatever. Um, you know, and, and it was, for me, it was that, and it was soccer. I played soccer. I wanted to be in a band. So I started playing in bands with friends and we were God awful. Yeah. Um, and then we, wrote some songs and they were terrible uh and then we got a little bit better and you know just kind of going to shows you make friends um you see the same people at a lot of different places and you just become friends with people um so i would spend my fridays and saturdays at different venues around long island just seeing my friends bands play or playing in different bands um and it was just always one of the things of you know what i want to i want to get out of long island i want to play a show in in new jersey i want to play a show in connecticut then you do that one you do a weekend with your friends where you cram into a minivan with all your gear and you sleep in a parking lot in a minivan with like five people, just, you know, somebody's in the driver's seat, passenger seat, and three people in the back seat just laying on top of your guitars. And, yeah. You know, you're like, this is the dream. Yeah, it's like, some well, dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then you get that done and you're just like, no, what? I want to do, I want to do more. And then you make it to like DC and Virginia and you're like, this could be something that this could be cool. Like, you know, people don't hate us. Um, so yeah, I've just, I've always like growing up, it was just a, one of those things of, you know, why not? And I think some of the bands from like the early 2000s, they always had videos that were being put out. So, yeah. you know, like what was it my space, like vlogs or whatever. Um, yeah. And it was always like, wait, that's what they're doing. They're, they're driving from here to here. And then they're like exploring this new city that they've never been to. And then they play a show and then they do it again the next day. Like that looks like that looks incredible. It look, I think, and you'll laugh at this. I think it looks awesome. It looks incredible until you're the one traveling. Um, Mm -hmm. And you're, you're kind of just doing it for the love of it. Right. Cause we're, you know, when we were in a band together, we weren't making money, No, Um, but you were doing it for the friendship. Um, and it's it's something I think that like you never thought you'd experience, but you, you end up doing it. And if you do it with the right people, it can be something that's that's really cool. But one thing I want to go back to is like, you know, talking about Long Island and the scene, because it reminds like Long Island to me is one of when I think about iconic music scenes as far as in that um pop punk punk rock post hardcore hardcore scenes you can't you can't talk about those eras and those genres without talking about long island because yeah. when you think about pop punk punk rock you think about bands like taking back sunday um you think about bands like bayside who were iconic bands obviously brand new but i i tend to i tend to leave them out of the convo now um, because of all of the like ridiculousness that's well, gone on with them, you'll appreciate. I think you'll appreciate this. Uh, 
you know, obviously, you know, Long Beach, there's a beer distributor over here um, that uh, one of the guitar players of brand new owns. But he was really he was on like he was on Deja um, and he he was like the fifth member of the band, I believe. Nice. Um, or, but yeah, he, he I walked in there uh, a week or two ago and there's a Deja and Tendu gold record on the wall. And I'm like, interesting. that's a good spot for it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, interesting. But no, but definitely, like you know, you got like the movie life and all those bands. From yeah, I mean, if you and of, if you, yeah, if you go back to, you know, well, like the drive-through era, the drive-through records yeah. era, the Victory Records era, um, the sleeping. I'd be ridiculous if I didn't if I didn't shout the the sleeping out because they they encompassed them and Bayside. I think. At, in, in my days of going to shows encompass what long island was about as a music scene was just this family of people that followed these bands and was so into the music they lived and breathed that music yeah. every part of that music was was what was it was just felt like people were like they were writing the songs for those specific people and those specific people really felt that way Envy on the Coast yeah. is another band that like, absolutely. for me, before I had joined my own band at that time, um, I was going to those, those shows. And I, I can only imagine that we probably crossed paths before we knew oh, each other. A hundred times probably. Because I remember going to shows at like Temple Betham yep. um, and a couple places, seeing Envy on the Coast before they were Envy on the Coast and they were written water. Um, and then falling yep. in love with them yeah. when they put out their EP. Um, but so fast forward a little bit and we join a band together. Yep. Um, I join, um, basically under this like emergency circumstance. Um, the singer at the time was having, um, vocal problems. They called me, I was in Chicago auditioning for American Idol. Um, the best part about this whole entire story is uh, yeah, I, and I, and they, I had a phone call. Yeah. Well, that phone call, that was my first. So I had gone up there like a couple of days beforehand and I didn't know the songs yet. So they, the whole plan was like, they were going to have somebody play um, like their buddy, uh, I'm blanking on his name, was going to play bass for that show. So I was standing there watching and all of a sudden I'm like, wait, what's going on? And then they get off stage and I'm like, wait, I just, I just came up here like a couple of days ago. I quit my pizza delivery job. Yeah. And now, now we're calling, now we're calling Danny uh who's in chicago right now and i'm like what, what is going on yeah so and it's so funny you say that because i don't even i don't even remember that that what that is what happened because i had gotten a phone call from their their manager sean shout out sean gordon um and jay uh jay the singer was kind of in the background you know like and they kind of presented this to me and that moment i had just before they called me i'd gotten the call that i didn't make it to the next round of auditions um so i had this decision to make right and i made the decision to go up to mass ship up to massachusetts and lo and behold we we learned songs we went on tour and i think for a short period of time and you could correct me if i'm wrong do you feel like you ended up from where you talked about that dream of like traveling with your friends and getting to perform for people. And I know not every night was great, but those That's nights not. in Massachusetts were great. Oh, they were unbelievable. You know, those local shows the, in Massachusetts and all the New England shows were incredible. And Rhode Island, all those places, Vermont, all those places we play were packed. So do you feel like you reached that, that height with, you know, that band? I think it was, yeah, absolutely. Because it was, it was just this cool, experience of you know I had no responsibilities at that time it was it was um like I said I quit my pizza delivery job yeah um and we we slept on the floor in a futon of our friend's parents house yeah um you know and we played we played shows like the Dover Brick House shows like those those, those shows were always incredible fantastic. um you know we were opening for all these cool bands as well um and then like i always think about the fact that you know we, we played in corpus christi texas and that which mm -hmm. is an absolutely ridiculous night in general but 
it was a good show. And then we ended up having a bonfire on the beach. And like that, I think that like epitomizes the, hey, you grew up watching all of these bands post these videos of like them doing this fun stuff all around the country. And, you know, yeah, you played a good show and then you got to do something you never thought you'd do in a place you never thought you'd be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think because of all that experience, I mean, I've been to, I've been to places I've never even heard of. Yeah. You know, I remember, I remember we went to a rest stop one time and it was boot, boondocks. It was like a, all these bumper stickers that they had that was like, there really is a boondocks. And I think it, I want to say it was like Iowa or Idaho or. Are you talking about the Iowa 80? No, 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 no. We didn't. Oh, I was no, going to say, the cause Iowa the 80. Iowa 80, I would, Iowa 80, I would literally get in my car right now and drive to. If all you I talked could. about the entire touring, like every tour we were on, you were like, I want to, we got to stop at Iowa 80. But I think well, it was Boondocks, I think it was a town name. And it was like, the, what? Yeah, it was, it was, you, you know, when you're traveling the country, you realize there's a lot of life outside of your, your small towns. I, at the time I was, I was living in Queens, New York, Kyle, you were living in Levittown. Levittown. You yep, were living in Levittown, you know, in Long Island, on, on Long Island. On, on Long Island. My bad. And, <laughs> um, you know, when you see like, and I, I'll tell this story till, till people stop listening. I didn't know that tumbleweeds were real until I went on tour with my first band and we were in the middle of the desert and a tumbleweed goes rolling by and all of a sudden you see an armadillo on the side of the road and you, and you go, what? I'm in a movie and sometimes yeah. touring and being in a band can feel like you're in a movie. And I think especially the way we did it was, you know, we weren't playing huge shows, you know, we weren't playing big things, but we, I think we were able to capture special moments. And I think those special moments like really bring people together. Like you mentioned the bonfire on the beach. What I, was that the same time when, there was also Red Tide. Yes, 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 yes. So, yes. <laughs> with, every, with every good thing, as Kyle is saying, you know, living up to this big dream, there's another one. And I think this is a, a hilarious story. It was something called Red Tide, which we had no idea what the heck it was. But all of the, I think a, a few of the other bands we were out, or two of the other bands we were like playing around with that, at that time, um, kind of knew what it was. Yeah, and, I think one of them definitely, one of them yeah, definitely did. We woke up, you know, you, you have the bonfire and we were, we ended up like sleeping in the, like going to sleep in the vans on the beach, but then waking up to this, oh. what I can only explain is violent smell of fish. And what happens is, is that the ocean, the beautiful, beautiful ocean brings in all of these fish. They all wash up ashore and essentially die. And then they just start to bake in the sun as you wake up and oh, it's, it was it's one of the most toxic, dangerous things as well. It, like after looking it up, it's terrible. Um, but like, you know, I think it's, it's so true for life, right? With, with, with every good thing, there's always something that kind of counters it and how do you deal with it? Right? Like at, at that time, like I think how we dealt with it and, and you can kind of expand on it was, it was the camaraderie we had for each other and the, and the friendship we all had for each other that really helped us to take, you know, appreciate those good moments, but it also helped us to get of, out of those bad moments. Yeah. And I think that it kind of, you know, definitely references back to, to support systems. And the only people out there are the people in your van. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, like, you know, I know I was lucky to have, you know, not to, uh, you know, to, to, put you on a pedestal or whatever word I'm looking for there but I was lucky enough to have you and every city we went to every we would load in we would like you know hang out for a bit and then it was always like all right Kyla let's go and we would explore and just hang out and walk around and talk and um, just check different places out and I know you and I did that all the time and a couple of the other guys uh, would do it too occasionally but I know it was me and you all at all times like just checking different places out. And that was something I made a conscious effort of I, or and that like that was definitely like premeditated before tours where I, I had been on countless tours before that, before like we had joined Lion and Fall, which was the band that we joined. Um, and there were times when I didn't do that and I regretted it. 
But yeah. then towards the end of that band, um, my band that I was in at the time, Bed Life for Blue Eyes, I was not a happy person and I did not have feel that I had that support system. So I would take it upon myself to create moments for myself that kept me on the road um, and kept me from not wanting to quit and move on. Um, so I would do that. So I knew at this point, uh, that's what I wanted to do. And, and I think we kind of found friendship in that where you were willing to kind of do those things yeah. um, and willing to like follow like crazy leads of like, let's go walk for two hours before a show yeah. and then go play a show. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think it's important that when you're doing something stressful, um, even though it seems like a dream and it seems like, like it's everything you ever wish for, sometimes there's moments where we need to reset, you know, take a breath and take in what's around us and be yeah. present and intentional. Um, and that's something I lack every day is, and I have to work on is being present and intentional with things that I do. Um, but at that time we were able to be present and intentional because the only, the only anxiety that we had was is anyone going to show gonna, up tonight? <laughs> is anyone going to show up? Yes. Is anyone going to show up tonight? But where were we going to go next? Like yeah. what we were going to do? And we were lucky enough. We didn't have too many troubles on the road. Um, no, no. We broke we down couple, maybe but... like twice or whatever or something like yeah. that. Like that was brutal. But, um, you know, we were lucky enough to not have to do that. But, um, yeah, I definitely think those moments help like help you realize like what's in front of you and you don't want to miss it. And I think that's something we've all gotten away from um, is being present and looking, yeah. looking at what's in front of us, not worrying about what's behind us and what's to come. I just dropped my pen. What's to come, you know, three years from now, but what's right in front of us. How important is it to look at what's right in front of you and and make sure that you're living in the moment. Yeah, and it's, 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 I think it's, you know, like you said, I've got to be better at that as well. I mean, it's very easy to kind of be like, all right, hey, in three years from now, I want to be here. In five years, I want to be here. And that's all necessary and it's important, I think. And, um, you know, you don't get anywhere without that, but being able to appreciate kind of the journey. Right, um, yeah. You know, I think it, it, it's, uh, I think it's a Frank Turner lyric. That's, uh, if you're all about the destination, then take a flight. Um, yeah. it's, it's like, you know, you gotta, you have to enjoy the, the everyday, um, experiences. And, um, you know, I think going back to the, an earlier story about me going into Puerto Rico, my friend Erica is incredible at that. She is very, very forward thinking in terms of, all right, I have this goal, this goal, this goal. I have to do this, this, this to get there. But every single night she would be you know, working and all of a sudden it would be like, Hey, sunsets in 20 minutes, let's go. And it was yeah. all of a sudden drop everything. Let's go see the sunset. Um, you know, and, uh, I third wheeled it with my buddy, Mike, which is her now fiance and her, and we would go and watch the sunset every single night. Um, you know, I know for a fact that every morning, um, in the summer, she goes down to the beach with her coffee. And she just sits there and kind of just chills and, and takes it all in. And it's just like one of those things that I see that it's like, you know what, just remember to take that time and to, yeah. to live the day as opposed to just looking previously or forward. And it's definitely not easy for me to do it. And I need to be better at it as well. But it's just such a cool thing to see somebody able to do it. Yeah. And I think if we look at it and it's kind of how I lived my life when I was in the band with you. And it's something like I want to practice in my life again is realizing that like, and it's, and it sounds so cliche, but like time is, is precious, right? We don't get much time and we don't get a whole lot of time with, with the people that we love with ourselves and, you know, trying to capture those moments like a sunset, right. Or trying to capture those moments where I'm egging you on to go and walk around with me in a random place for two hours and saying, we got to find this place I ate at eight years ago yeah. and <laughs> you're going to love it. Trust me. 
we're in Texas, let's go to this place called Jackalopes. It's the best hot dog you'll ever get. Um, or this is the best barbecue you ever get. Um, like, like that spot in Oklahoma City. Where, right? Uh, the, Elvis is the, chef. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And he claimed for, that he killed Elvis. I have no idea what the name of the place was, but. No clue. Oklahoma City. Man, that brings back memories. Yep. Um, <laughs> like, those are things that we've, got, we've all gotten away from. We've all gotten away from capturing those moments. I can't tell you how many times that I get so involved in my own head that I always am, and I'm, I'm always towing that line of missing a moment with my daughter, with my wife, with my family, because I'm so worried about other things. And I think that's something, you know, if we could all realize that like time just flies by and we, we all, we all should work on taking that moment or finding a support system that forces us to take those moments and says, Oh, it's time for sunset. Let's go. Yeah. You know, like, let's do this. Oh, I'm going to the beach to drink my coffee. Come with me. Or Kyle, like big deal. You overdrafted your card, $8,000. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Cause you were buying a candy bar for 25 cents. Um, and $75 candy bar. Hey, if you're in a band, Right now, if you're in a if you're in a band <laughs> touring, which I know it must be the hardest thing in the world right now, and I don't envy you, always check your bank account and make sure that you are not overdrafting a candy bar for seventy five dollars for a Snickers bar. So full disclosure, not getting into that story, but my receipt from the ATM the day before said that I had about four hundred dollars in my bank account. And so. I remember that. I remember. That. <laughs> I, re I, I do remember that very very vividly. Um, because I, I want to say that we were in Chicago. We like, were. At that we, were time. Going to, we were going to Portillo's. Yeah, Portillo's. We were getting a Chicago dog and a cake shake. Yep. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's so important, everyone, to just find moments and, and live, in the, live in them and, and enjoy them and, and see them and don't let it pass you by because I think, one thing that I think the both of us can say is at one point we, we were really good at taking those moments and not letting them pass Very us by. Um, I still have so many great, great memories when I think back, you know, some of them wild, um, but others, you know, just great memories, spending time with, with you, um, with the rest of the band and doing things that at that time I thought were done in my life. Um, I didn't think I was going to be joining a band at that point in my life and going back on the road. I had been yeah. on the road for five years and I, I thought that life was over, <laughs> but being, being with people that I felt comfortable and supported by was, was so good. So I, one suggestion is just find, find support, reach out to people, find connection. Um, one of the biggest things for me now is, and especially in doing this is, connecting with people. Um, I think it's so important, but, um, one thing I like to do before we kind of close out, um, and I've done this and I say, I like to do it and I've only done two of these before you. <laughs> um, but I like, I like to think about curiosity, right. And sometimes like, like, like a lot of people, I feel hopeless in a lot of situations. And and one thing I've done is try and look at curiosity because I feel like if you're curious and you're thinking that you can decrease that hopelessness because you can find something somewhere in something. What is something right now, you know, or maybe you've been curious about that really helps you to kind of when you're feeling down, <clears throat> when you're feeling down, when you're feeling a little bit lost, that you can look to or you can you can think about and you're like, I'm so curious about that. I just need to dive into it. And then that that hopelessness goes, you know, does maybe doesn't go away, but it kind of for that moment you kind of feel like you can breathe. Um so the <laughs> First thing that comes to mind, which is probably not the um, greatest answer because it involves drinking, um, and that's you know not the best coping mechanism for things, but it's it's kind of like I enjoy making cocktails at home. 
Okay. Um, you know, it's it's just a an experiment with different flavors and different flavor profiles and just trying Absolutely. new things and things I've never tried before. Um, you know, so it's as I'm looking at my bar, um, it's it's just the process and it kind of takes my mind off of a lot of things. Um, you know, thinking like, hey, which bitter will work with this whiskey or rum or whatever base spirit I'm using at that point. But it's, you know, I've got right now, I actually have a book that I've been reading on the beach that's called Amaro. It's all about Italian bitters, okay. um, which makes me sound like an absolute nerd. Um, hey. But it's, uh, it's just interesting, you know, just learning about these different things that have been made for 200 years for 150 uh, yeah. years by by monks uh, or you know some random family in Italy just started making this and they bottled it as medicine and all of a sudden it's now you know worth millions and millions of dollars and sold all over the world right um so just kind of like taking and reading about different flavor profiles and kind of trying to make my own version of things that somebody's probably bound to make better Right. Um, but it just takes my mind off a lot of things and keeps me occupied. And, um, and then at the end of it, you do have a nice little drink. Um, so that helps as well, but you know, so my, my, my next question to that would be, what is, what is your favorite drink to drink? What is your favorite drink to make? And are they the same? They, so I would say that my favorite drink or cocktail I've ever had is called the casualty it's from a bar on sixth street in the city called the Moria Margo um and I first time I ever went there was probably eight years ago or so they had it on the menu every time I've gone back it's not been on the menu until like a year ago um and it's just incredible I did reach out speaking of reaching out like you said to um people that you might look up to or idolize um, during the beginning stages of, of the pandemic, uh, the owner or bartender of that bar started doing an ask me anything on Instagram. And I reached out, I asked for the recipe and he came back, gave me the recipe and I've still not made it yet uh, because I know it's not going to be as good. Um, but I would say my favorite drink to make is probably it's from a book uh, from a bar called Death and Company and it's called the Oaxacan Old Fashioned. So it's tequila, mezcal, agave, nectar or syrup, um, bitters, and then you flame an orange peel over it. So it's basically like a smoky old fashioned and it's delicious and simple and relaxing. All I know is there's, there's nothing simple and relaxing that like, that it doesn't sound like there's anything simple and relaxing <laughs> about it, a drink that comes from a place called Death and Company. I think it's, uh, that's fair. That's fair. Like, I would feel like perhaps that, like, I should be a little bit nervous drinking a no, drink no, no. from so there. They are, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I think they're routinely named in one of the top 100 bars in the country yeah. or something like that. But um, no, it's, it's not what you think. There is a, there's a reason for the name and I can't think of it. Off oh, the top I'm, of my sure, head, but, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, but it's something like death and taxes or, you know. Right. But I definitely think, you know, it's like I said, it's so important. Like you kind of found that thing that keeps you curious and keeps you, you know, you had said, oh, drinking, maybe it's not the, the, the best thing, but I'm looking at it from it, from a, a point of view of the, you taking the time to like, look all this stuff up, taking the time to craft the perfect drink, um, and it's something that you're interested in, you know, and yeah. it's something that, that gives you that sense of when I'm done with a, a day of work, I'm going to come home and I'm going to like, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it. Um, you know, anything in excess could be an issue. Um, right. Yeah. But yeah. Um, when you're getting into that, that, that science of, of things, um, you can go on and on and on. It makes I have no thought process on it um, because I don't think I can, I, I don't think I could ever, ever do that. Like I, I'm the type of person that could probably like screw up a glass of water. Um, but um, yeah, I think, I think to kind of round this out, I think it's, it's fair to say, you know, take a breath, reach out to your support system and realize that 
just because you were somewhere doesn't mean you can't go somewhere else. And it doesn't mean that you can't pivot and find that strength to say, this is what I thought my whole life was going to be, but I have to make a different decision and realize that while it's scary, it also can be, if you tilt your head and look at it from a different perspective, it could also mean that you're now looking, you know, you're turning that page and now you're looking at writing a whole nother story. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, now this is on record. Um, uh, I need, I want you to hold me accountable in terms of uh, living in the moment and looking at things like that. So, and I, and I hope, I, I hope <laughs> that if you see me slipping on that as well, you'll hold me accountable, but Kyle, I thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. I think there's a lot of people that are going to get a lot out of your story and your, you know, your journey from, you know, kid growing up in Long Island, looking at a big dream to, to be in the music scene, but then also being a business owner, having to pivot, having to fight through a lot of adversity and coming out on the other side of it now with an outlook that is totally different than what it was maybe two, two and a half years ago. Absolutely. And I, I appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this too. Absolutely. Thank you.